Crispin, Cross of Lead, Chapter 4. Following my escape from John A. Cliff and my night of forest hiding, it was the sound of tolling bell that woke me. Dawn had come and the Stromford Church was announcing early morning prayers, prime. In haste, I made the sign of the cross over my heart, offered up my daily prayer and listened closely. All I heard was the sound of the bell and muted forest babble, nothing to alarm me. Once awake, however, I could only think of what I'd seen the night before, the meeting in the woods of the steward and the stranger. Nor could I remove from my mind the steward's hateful look when he brought down his sword with the clear intent of killing me. Even so, I tried to convince myself that it would not matter. In the past, Acliffe had treated me badly. His attack on me the night before was not that great an exception. Why should he, I told myself, be concerned that I, a nobody, had seen him in his forest meeting? It seemed my best course of action would be to return to my home and act as though nothing untoward had occurred. With the coming of morning's light, it took little to determine where I was. I made my way toward the village. Since my mother had been a quotar, one who held no land in her own right, she and I lived in a rented one-room dwelling that stood at the far end of our village by a northern boundary cross. A thin thatch roof kept out most rain. Earth was our floor, and since it was at some distance from the village, I was able to remain hidden from those who had already gone to their daily labor. I was just about to emerge from the woods and run toward our hut when I caught sight of the bailiff, Roger Kingsworthy, and the reeve, Odo Langland. Not only were they carrying pikes and axes, they were heading for my cottage. Unsettled, I drew back quickly and concealed myself behind some bushes to observe their intentions as they entered our small building. Perhaps they were looking for me because they emerged in moments, but then to my great shock, they began to use their tools to pull the structure down. The cottage being of small, mean construction could not withstand their assault. Within moments, it was little more than a heap of thatch, wattle, and clay. Not content with that, Kinsworthy produced a flint from his wallet, struck sparks, and set ablaze the place I had called my home for 13 years. Deeply shaken, I fled back into the forest. As I went, I kept asking myself why they should have done such a thing. I could not believe it was merely because I'd seen the steward in the forest that night before. Once within the woods, I decided to go to a high rock which stood near the forest edge and overlooked our village. Though the rock was difficult to climb, I'd done so before on one of my solitary rambles. It was to be hoped that I'd see something to help me understand what was happening. It was not, however, until mid-morning, which I knew by the position of the sun and the ringing of the church bell proclaiming terse, that I reached the rock. Once having made sure I was alone, I climbed. While the rock was not an easy ascent, at some places it was a little less than a cliff, I reached the pinnacle. Once there, I took the further precaution of lying down. Only then did I lift my head and look about. Before me, like some rolled up tapestry, was my entire world. Beneath the sky as blue as Our Lady's blessed robes, a contrast to the greening spring that lay abundant everywhere. Overhead, swallows flitted, free as birds ever are. To the west meandered the river Strom, glittering like a silver ribbon in the golden sun. At this point, the river ran at a shallow depth. Like most, I could not swim, but for much of the year, one could wade across. Above and below this ford, depending on the season, the water ran quite deep. A few paces from the river's bank, on the village side stood one of the stone crosses that marked Stromford's western limit. Covered by mystic markings, this cross had been erected where St. Giles had once appeared. There on the river's low tree-lined banks stood our noble's house, Lord Furnival's Manor, the grandest house I knew. It was where the steward had lived for many years in the absence of the night. 
with stone walls two levels high and small windows, the manor was to me like a castle, high, mighty, and impenetrable. Inside, I had never been allowed to enter, but I'd been told was an arched hall with a long trestle table and benches, several sleeping rooms, and a chapel. On the walls hung pictures of saints, along with ancient battle shields. The lower level was a large storage place meant for the wheat and other foods the villagers produced. Opposite the manor house, across a road, was the mill. Smaller than Lord Furnival's dwelling, it was built of stout timbers with grinding wheels of massive stone. These wheels were turned by river water, delivered by a run. Not only did the mill grind our wheat and barley at a cost, it contained the ovens where we villagers, by the steward's decree, baked our bread, which required yet another fee. A road led from the river bank. Once a traveler had crossed the river, a road led east and reached another road that ran north and south. Where these roads met, our stone church, St. Giles by the River, stood with its ancient bell. Above and below the church were our dwelling places, some 40 cottages and huts of wattle and daub, thatch and wood, dirt and mud, all in varying shades of brown. North of the village was the commons, where we peasants grazed our oxen and sheep. Here, too, were the archery butts where men of age were required by King Edward's decree to practice every Sunday. It was also the place where the public stocks and gallows stood. The land for growing crops was laid out in long, narrow strips. One of three strips was planted with barley, another wheat. The final third lay fallow for the grazing of the manor's cattle. As for the two roads that passed through Stromford, all I knew was that they led to the rest of England, of which I had no knowledge. And beyond England, I suppose, came the remaining world, Great Christendom, our priest called it. But in all my life, I'd never gone past the boundary crosses which marked the limits of our village. Emerging from the woods, the cottages, the manor house, the mill, the roads, the growing lands, the commons, even the church itself to the tiny cross behind our cottages used for planting herbs and roots, Everything belonged to Lord Furnival, who held it in the king's name. Indeed, the steward said, we belong to our Lord as well. Like all villagers, we were required to ask the steward's permission to be excused from work if ill, to grind our wheat or bake it, to buy or sell, to travel from our parish, to marry, even to baptize our children. In return, we gained two things. When we died, there was hope of heaven, and Lord Furnival protected us from the Scots, the French, the Danes, and the wicked infidels. But that morning, I had little doubt I'd never be protected again.